to another episode of FAQ Mondays. I'm your host, Fluff. You know what? No talking, no gibberish. We're just going to dive right into it. Cool? Cool. But that's it. How does one give themselves a unique tone slash production when everyone has the same plugins and samples? Ooh, great question, Alan. Um, I think, I think this is always a, a good question to ask. You know, this was always a problem even back in the day when, you know, uh, resources were limited to some of our favorite musicians only being able to get, you know, they can, they only had access to Fender, you know, Fender combos or PV amps or PV guitars or whatever. They were always guitarists and our favorite musicians always initially started out making the most of the tools they have at hand. Um, Nowadays, it's option paralysis as far as guitar tones, drum programs, recording software, plugins, tone shaping tools, pedals, overdrives. The sky is the limit nowadays. So your question is even more valid and relevant to, in today's climate. And my answer to you on how to really stand out and find a unique tone is to use your ears. Know what you like and know what you don't like. Um, now it's easy to use other people's tones and drum samples to go, okay, I like that. But that doesn't mean you have to have that or settle for that. Uh, for example, nothing stopping you from, you know, really, really EQing the crap out of a get good snare drum, for example, to your own taste or mixing it with other samples uh, with guitar amp sims. There's nothing saying that you have to use the same um, amp sim for both of your tracks. Maybe you mix it up and get a totally different tone with the mixture of, you know, an STL tones amp sim and my signature amp sim from uh, ML Sound Lab, you know, amp roots or something like that. Or if you're using a neural DSP guitar amp sim, maybe you mix that with a real amp and the sound is cool. You know, Nickelback Records used to have amp farm mixed with a real uh, triple rectifier. So I would encourage you to mix and match everything because there are so many options for you to use at your disposal. Um, but also use your ear, man. It's okay. These days, everyone gets lambasted for, for not sounding like that other guy. That, that's the worst 5150 tone I've ever heard. Well, you know what? It's the tone that I like. So eat me. So don't be afraid to be different and to stick out. Do what you think is cool. Don't worry about everyone else. What is your approach to mixing guitars for videos? Is there any tips you have for making your mixes translate well through all platforms, headphones, phone speakers, etc.? Mike, the throat, Davenport. I've no, I don't, I have no idea why they call you the throat and I don't want to know why they call you the throat. However, Mike, great question. Um, I did a course, it's not out yet. I filmed a course on how I mix my audio for my YouTube videos um, and really, be aware of the mid range, the mid range frequencies, because those are going to get accentuated the most on something like a cell phone. And, uh, the mid range is where the guitar lives. So you have to pay extra special attention to the mid range of your mix, but guitars specifically, since you know, your, your question was about pertaining to guitars, making sure you're able to listen accurately is, has been the biggest struggle for me personally. I recently switched out my sub that I mix with for the matching Neumann sub, the KH750 that goes with my monitors and has completely changed the way I hear all of the music. I was unaware that the JBL, the giant JBL subwoofer that I've had this whole time was completely ruining and ruining my mixes. I wasn't hearing anything accurately at all. So really making sure you are accurately hearing what is actually going on is most of the battle. And to that end, you know, a simple and easy solution would be uh, something like Sonarworks. Um, they have wonderful correction software for headphones. Um, that will do a lot to make sure that your guitar tones translate over all mediums, because once you have something that's truly good, it will legit sound good on a phone, headphones in the car and the radio on a crappy little, you know, JBL, Bluetooth speaker, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, accurate listening is key. Your favorite interface for under $300. Omar, thank you so much for the question. Favorite interface for under $300 would probably be the Focusrite 2i4 or 
Um, audience, audience, audience stuff sounds fantastic. I think the Audient ID4 is very, very nice as well. Um, for four hundred dollars, you can get definitely some decent um, interfaces, and you know you'll get some decent converters. Um, Audient and Focus are, are what I would personally choose if I had a $300 budget for a recording interface. I will link down to both of them in the description though. For a while you were endorsed by Orange Amps. Did your relationship with Orange sour? Larry, thank you so much for your question. Uh, no, not really. Um, Alex, longtime Orange rep, global artist rep, uh, recently stepped down. That definitely had a lot to do with it because when you have a relationship with a company, you're really having a relationship with a person at that company. Uh, someone that you are, you know, texting with in your moments of, oh God, my thing is broken, what do I do? Or uh, something got ruined, can I get something overnighted? You know, you are developing a longstanding relationship with that person, not some faceless company. So Alex stepping down had a lot to do with it. Um, Alex just moved on, he was at Orange for 14 years. Um, that had a lot to do with Dragged Under stepping away and myself stepping away from being orange artists. However, I was always, I was never not a Maze of Boogie artist. I've always been passionate about Maze of Boogie amps and cabs. I think their cabs are the best, uh, for me personally, just for my own personal tastes. Uh, the Rectifier 412 and the Rectifier 212 are my favorite cabinets I've ever played through and toured with. Um, they just have a real sound that my ears are tuned to. However, I just love Maze of Boogie amplifiers. I always have that. That's that was from when this channel first started. My first, my first like five videos are with a dual rectifier. So, you know, I love, I love Maze of Boogie stuff. I do love Orange stuff as well. But really, it was um, us leaving Orange had more to do with the backline stuff. And you know, Drag Denver will be going over to Europe many times over the next two years. Um, we need backline support, we need good tone, and we need to be super, super tight with the people and the friends that are there at that given company and Maze of Boogie fits that bill. So that's ultimately why we're back to using the Maze of Boogie stuff. Not to say that Orange isn't great. I love Orange and I uh, still have and record. There's an Orange 212 in the next room from where I'm filming this right now. Uh, it's one of my favorite cabinets I've ever toured with. However, yeah, man, just Maze Boogie. That's just, uh, I don't know, that, that satisfies my inner 14 year old. If you could go back to the start of your guitar playing, would you change anything? Ooh. Um, I would change something if I could go back. I would have spent more time on, on theory, not not learning how to shred. I have never ever regretted for a moment not knowing how to do crazy wild sweep, sweep picking and stuff like that. I never ever wanted to be Kirk Hammett. I always wanted to be James Hetfield. I wanted to be a great songwriter and I wanted to be a great riff writer. That was always just my personal tastes. Um, but I do wish I would have spent more time learning musical theory and knowing why things work where they do and where to go to better utilize my songwriting. Because even now, um, I have to work three times as hard, I feel like, to get to where I'm eventually gonna wanna end up as opposed to someone who actually knows theory. And I know this because in Dragged Under, when we're in the studio with our producer Hiram, who is pretty well versed in theory, he'll go, oh, you should go to the C for that, or you should go, you should do this harmonic minor thing. And I'm like, huh? Um, he can just get there faster. That's not to say I can't get there in a songwriting context. However, I wish I would have spent the time in my formative years learning way more theory than I did because I only knew basic chords. I had an Ernie Ball chord book and that was basically it. Um, I didn't really have access to learn theory back in those days, back in 1994. So it is what it is, but I, that, was, that would be the one thing I would change. Why no Gibson SGs? Uh, well, um, well, I've had SGs. I've had a couple of SGs several years ago. If you go back to like my videos in like 2015, 2014, I had some, uh, some SGJs that were cool. SGs for me are too, they're too thin, but they're too this way. They feel too forward. 
They're cool when you have them uh, standing up, like strapped to yourself, like when you're standing up playing in a playing position, but sitting down, it's not that comfortable. They're neck heavy, nah, I don't know. I love how they look and they're cool. I love their aesthetic, but they just, I don't know. They kind of look goofy on me. They kind of feel goofy on me as well. So yeah, I don't know. Let's just start my thing. As a fellow big guy, what do you look for in a guitar as it pertains to your body type? That's a great question, Adam. Um, I am not a small dude. Uh, I'm like six foot one and I'm like, you know, 260 pounds. Uh, I'm a big dude. And thusly, I don't like small guitars. I don't like to feel like a guitar is the size of a ukulele on me. For example, the Ernie Ball Music Man Majesty guitars. I've said this before in other videos. They're great ergonomic, great sounding guitars. They look goofy on me. They look really, really goofy on me. However, you know, something, something like a Stingray, like a more strat -y, full scale, not that the Majesty is not full scale, but something more traditional that is larger or my Gibson RDs, for example, that's a huge guitar that looks right on me proportionally. So I like to look for something that is a large enough body size that it just, it simply doesn't look goofy on me and doesn't feel goofy on me as well. It's really all I look for. And that does it for this episode of FAQ Monday. If you have a question of your own, feel free to leave them down below in the description or uh, send me a tweet. I'm on Twitter quite a bit these days. And with that, you've been wonderful, I've been Fluff. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.